morning. Hold them up. Or technology. It's good to see the sword in the hand. Wow. This morning I'm preaching out of Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 35. And the title of my message is Peter's Vision Expands. Peter's Vision Expands. But before we go any further, let's just pray. Father, I ask that you would anoint me to teach this message under the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Lord, give us ears to hear. Give us an understanding heart, Father. And Lord, in this we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor in your precious holy name. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 10 has to deal with Cornelius. And the Bible says that Cornelius was a devout man, one who feared God with all his household, and who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision the angel of the Lord coming to him and said, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send a man to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. This morning, I, I want to talk about this, this move of God that was taking place in the book of Acts. I also want to let you know that on Wednesday nights, we're diving into the book of Acts. We're doing a study, line by line, sentence by sentence, possibly word by word. The book of Acts is a historical book. It's where we've come from, and it was the, talks about the birth of the church. And as we're heading into the Pentecost season, I feel like it's important that we have a clear understanding of who we are as Pentecostal believers. So Wednesday nights, adults meet at 6.30, the youth meets at 6. So before I go any further, though, I want to pull something up on the screen. Because Cornelius sent servants to Simon the Tanner's house. And right there, when we went to Israel, that is the door, they say, to Simon the Tanner's house. This is the house that Cornelius sent his servants to, to invite Simon uh, Peter to, to come join him. Here's a close-up of the writing on the door. Can you read Hebrew? It's right there if you want to read it out loud. We don't like to hear it. But um, this is when we were in Israel. This is looking down the street from his house. It's Tanya begging me to allow her to bring this kitten home from Israel. <laughs> what can I say? Here's some more. That's, that's the Mediterranean right there, right? My beautiful wife, the Mediterranean. It was gorgeous. Simon the Tanner's house was right on the sea. So on the other side of his house, you could see the Mediterranean. We had to walk through the area to, there's some more shots of it. Anyway, I keep taking pictures so that I can have screensavers of my gorgeous wife there. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> let me go back. So there's Simon the Tanner's house. This is the house that Cornelius sent people to to retrieve Peter. All right, And the word says that Cornelius was a man who feared God. He was a devout man who feared God. Last couple of weeks I've been talking about the Pentecostal movement and talking about rebuilding the Pentecostal experience and how we're entering into the Pentecostal season. And I've been talking about how God is the greatest master planner of all times. I've said this the past three weeks. He knew exactly what he was going to do and how he was going to do it. Genesis 1.1 says it all. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word created here in Strong's is to form or to fashion, to produce or to create. As God began to fashion the world in humanity, he had the end in mind. You see... We moved to Jesus, and he laid a plan for the future. He, he reminded his men 
that he would prepare a place for them and that he would prepare them for that place as well. He laid the plans for the Holy Spirit to finish the work that he began. We're living in that time where Holy Spirit is finishing the work that he began. Church, I love this fact. I love that when God created the heavens and the earth, he had the end in mind. I love the fact that he had the overall picture, the big picture of how everything was going to look and how things were going to turn out long before he even started. This morning, I called up a young artist who was unprepared because I called him out of the blue, but I'm going to have Adam come back up here and join me for just a second. And uh, Adam's journey has been kind of interesting because he's an engineer by design and had an engineering job when God spoke to him and said, I want you to shift your field. And so now he's studying art. So he was showing me some of the pictures and I was like, where'd you take that picture? He goes, no, that's my painting. I was like, wow, that's pretty good. So this morning I asked Adam, I said, before you start painting, uh, what's the first thing you see? Just like looking at composition, how it balances, you know, how the, it feels on the page and just kind of, you know, putting things together. And... So basically, to summarize that, you look at something and you have an idea where you're going, mm -hmm. right? So you look, what, what was the name of that fountain again? Uh, it's in McQueen's Apple Orchard. There's a, a fountain there. There's a fountain in McQueen's Apple Orchard. It's pretty cool that he has painted. And that's the picture that I thought he had taken a picture of. So you knew where you were going before you even put paint to canvas, right? Yeah. You don't just sit down and start painting and see where it goes, do you? Well, you can if you want to be like that. Okay, you don't do that. Go sit down. No, I'm just like kidding. I'm kidding. Art, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he has an idea where he's going, even in abstract art. I hope. <laughs> There's still planning involved with that, too. There's still planning involved with that, but the, the, the bottom line is, is when an artist puts paint on canvas, he has an idea where he's going. He kind of sees a finished product before, even if it's abstract art, right? Yeah. Good. Go sit down quick. No, <laughs> no, for real. Thanks, Adam. I appreciate you helping out. <clears throat> so before he even goes, he's got an idea. Before God created the heavens and the earth, he had an idea where he was. <laughs> he had an idea where he was going. He wasn't creating abstract art. He had an idea where he was going. He had a form. He had a fashion, and he created it. And he had the end in mind. Jesus comes along and he lays the plan for the future. He reminded his men that he would prepare them for a place. He would prepare them for a place and that he was preparing a place for them as well. He laid the plans for the Holy Spirit to finish the work that he had begun. My first point this morning is supernatural revelation. Supernatural revelation. I got a frozen iPad here for some reason. It's not scrolling. Praise God for. What's that? Man. Yeah. So, y'all, I got to tell you something. There it goes. Hello. I got to tell you, we had somebody, postman stopped by the other day, and one of the um, envelopes was 20 cents short. Uh, so, Miss Katrina graciously dug into her bank and divvied up the 20 cents, and you're not getting reimbursed after that comment. <laughs> you're eating that 20 cents. <laughs> I'm kidding. We wrote a check for you. It's <laughs> so I'm just going to take a second here. Why is this not working? Don't touch it. My first point, thank you for tuning in. <laughs> Supernatural revelation. 
We have God speaking to Cornelius about going to and bringing Simon Peter back to his house. In the meantime, in chapter 10, 1 through 35, we have God speaking to Peter through a vision. The Bible says that Peter went on the top of the house to pray. He was hungry and it was about lunchtime or about mealtime. So while me, the meal was being prepared, he went to pray he, and he fell into a trance, the Bible says. And while he was praying, he had a vision of a sheet coming down. And in that sheet were things that were considered for a Jewish person to eat clean. And then there were things that were considered unclean where a Jewish person couldn't eat. And they were all combined and meshed together. And in the, in the, in the vision, the voice of the Lord spoke to him and said, eat. And Peter wrestled with that voice and he said, I can't eat, that is unclean. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to him and said, what I have made clean, do not call unclean. And in this process, God was preparing Peter for where he was about to go to. In the meantime, you have Cornelius, who is a high-ranking Italian military officer, who is a Gentile. And at that time, culturally, the Gentiles and the Jews did not intermingle. In fact, Jews were not supposed to go to other nations like that, period. Here Peter is, he's having this vision from God of all this clean and unclean animals that you can eat and you can't eat. And they're all mixed together. And that was taboo in the Jewish culture. And on the other end, here he's in Joppa and, and, and uh, Cornelius is about 30 miles away and God is speaking to him saying, there's a man in Joppa, his name is Simon Peter. He was staying with Simon and Tanner right on the sea there. Go to him and have him brought to your house. Do you hear how God is working through both people? Peter's in prayer, seeking God. Cornelius is a devout man who prays, seeking God. Like I said, my first point is the supernatural revelation. You see, Jews took seriously the pattern of praying three times a day. We see in Psalms 55 and also in Daniel chapter 6 where that reference of praying three times a day has taken place. Peter is praying. It, they prayed in the morning, in the, at noon, and in the evening. Peter's in prayer at this time. And the Bible says that Peter fell into a trance which he was in which he was commanded to kill and eat all the animals, the reptiles, the birds. The problem was that the animals were mixed, clean and unclean, and the beasts were gathered together. In the Levitical laws, in Leviticus chapter 11, Jewish people were taught from childhood never to touch or to eat any animal that was unclean. Never to touch or eat any animal that was unclean. So all these animals that were gathered, the clean and the unclean, it made the other animals basically unclean. The effect of the vision was to announce to Peter that the distinction made in the Old Testament between food that was clean and therefore fit for human consumption and those that were unclean was now canceled. So future Jewish Christians could eat any food without fear of defilement. When we look in Mark chapter 7, we see where Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees. And, and they're getting ready to sit down to eat. And his disciples just sit down and start eating and they don't wash their hands. And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. It's our ritual that you wash before you eat. And Jesus goes on to tell them, he said, are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach? And the Lord, and, and Jesus is making it clear. He's saying, listen, it's not what goes in a man's heart or mouth that defiles him. What goes in his mouth goes to his stomach and on out. But it's what goes into a man's heart that makes him defiled. It what's, it's what goes into a man's heart that makes him unclean. So whether your hands are washed or not, it doesn't matter. That's just your ritual, but it has no spiritual impact or significance at all. See, it's all part of God's master plan. You see, when he got on that cross, he didn't get on the cross just for the Jews. 
When he got on that cross, he got on that cross for everyone. He got on the cross for the Jews, the Gentiles. He got on the cross for everyone. His blood washes and cleanses everyone. Jesus had a plan. His plan was to cross that cultural line that, 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 that customs had put in place. His plan was to cross that line that the Jewish customs had put in place, that Jews were not supposed to intermingle with Gentiles. He was crossing that line of the Levitical laws teaching on what was clean and unclean. And God is saying, listen, it is now time to cross these lines, and it is now time to go after the Gentiles. There was a supernatural visitation. As Peter was returning to consciousness, if you will, and wondering the significance of this unexpected dream that it might be, a messenger of Cornelius arrived at the door and inquired whether he was there or not. Isn't this amazing? Here, Cornelius is, has, has an angel speaking to him, saying, go and fetch or go and retrieve or go get uh, Simon Peter and bring him here. In the meantime, while God's dealing with Cornelius, God begins to deal with Peter and said, listen, I'm getting you ready to cross cultural lines in my name. And I want you to do this without doubt. Peter's coming out of this vision where God has given him a revelation. And while he's coming out of this vision, what does he hear? There's three men standing at the door that are Gentiles. Three men standing at the door that are Gentiles. And I love this. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit of the Lord said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, and go down to them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Peter's coming out of his prayer time and the Holy Spirit is saying, I have sent three men. They're at your door right now. Go to them without doubt. Go to them without doubt for I have sent them. Church, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag up front before we go any further. We're going to start the prayer one. That's where I want you praying for somebody that you know that does not know Jesus as their personal savior. Pray for your aunts and your uncles and your nieces and your nephews out of state. Pray for them as much as you can. But I'm talking about praying for somebody that's in your life that you see on a regular basis. At the end of the service, we're going to have you write their names down. And we're going to have you put them in an offering. And we're going to put them on the platform here. And we're going to pray for them week after week after week. You see, you're going to see where we're going. Because here, Peter and Cornelius, God is bringing these two together through prayer. And church, my faith and my trust is that through prayer, you're going to see the walls torn down in some of these relationships. And you're going to see some of your friends, your relatives come to Jesus. Why? Because not just you are praying for him, but the body of Christ is praying for him. Amen? Amen. Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, and go to them, doubting nothing. God had a plan in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God knew that he was going to send a servant from Cornelius' house to Peter because he knew this is how he was going to tear those lines down so that all the world could be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have Jews versus Gentiles. The breakdown of prejudice in a Jew named Simon. You know, church, I said in the first service, and I'm going to say it again in this service. The world is full of prejudices. We're being told that there's systemic racism in our nation. And I got the antidote for that. It's called the blood of Jesus. You see, if this kind of stuff is left to man, it festers and it grows, it divides and it breaks the world down. It breaks the country down. But if man were to get one-on-one -on -one with God, get alone with God, get on your knees before God and allow God to speak to your heart the way he speaks to Peter's heart in this and the way he spoke to Cornelius' heart, friend, I'm telling you right now, racism would come to an end right now. It would come to an end in the church because the church would realize red, yellow, black, and white. Oh boy, did I start that out wrong. He is precious. I can't even get it now. 
Is this Jesus loves the little children I'm trying to sing? Jesus loves the little children, all the red and yellow, black and white, are precious in his sight. One more time. No? <laughs> remember when they get up and direct like that from behind the corner? Right here, I remember that. I remember Dr. Abbott getting up here singing. We were taught at an early age that Jesus loves everyone. Here is a prime example of when that loving everyone started. See, Israel was the custodian of God's word to man. But when Christ came, God took another step to move to another stage of his master plan. Jesus Christ and his followers are now the custodian of God's revelation. It's no longer just Israel, just Jews who are to receive and to know and to be responsible for God's revelation. It is both Jews and Gentiles, all men everywhere. That's why Jesus got on the cross. He got on the cross so that all men everywhere could hear the good news of Jesus Christ, that they could get saved, they could repent from their sinful ways, and they could spend eternity with him in heaven. All men are now to rally around Jesus Christ and to take the responsibility for proclaiming God's revelation, his word, his law. It's no longer just the Jews, it's all men of all nations, all who will follow Christ and take on the responsibility for making him known. Church, it's our responsibility. It's up to us to take that responsibility on. You know, Jesus came to model Christianity for us. He came to model a lifestyle on how we are to live. Not only did he model, but he mentored us as well. Jesus had 12 disciples. Jesus had 12 disciples that he modeled and he mentored a relationship with God for. And through that modeling and mentoring, he multiplied it because now these 12 disciples, apostles, are out. And what are they doing? They're modeling and they're mentoring for the multiplication of the kingdom of heaven. And in this modeling and mentoring, Peter is modeling and mentoring the fact that he no longer looks at a cultural divide between people. God has spoken to him and said that cultural divide has to come to an end. God spoke to Cornelius and said that cultural divide has to come to an end. My final point is the supernatural confirmation. So here they are. There's the knock on the door. Peter says, I'm coming. And Peter took about six Jewish believers with him. You see, Peter knew that he was treading terrible waters by associating with Gentiles. He sensed he would need witnesses to what he was going to do because this was culturally unacceptable. He knew he was walking into dangerous potential territory. But he also knew that God was calling him into that territory, church. Here's some of the preparations that were made by Cornelius. He was expectant. He was excited. He eagerly waited for their arrivals. He had called together his kinsmen and his close friends, and there were many in that house that were present. Some commentators say that, that Cornelius had possibly heard of how God was using Peter, and he's like, we need to bring Simon Peter. We need to bring that man, or, or God is telling us to bring that man to our house, and I want all my friends and I want all my family to participate in what God is doing through this individual. Church, this is how we should be. We should be like, listen, I want all my friends, I want all my family to participate in what God is doing in our hearts and our lives. How did Jesus prepare? Oh, and then, and then the, the combination of the Jew and the Gentile. 
The two men were humbled by God. Cornelius had been humbled by the, the vision of God. He had been mulling it over, mulling over the experience for four days now, being humbled and prepared more and more to receive this Jewish messenger. And when he, when he was confronted with Peter, he was so humble that he prostrated himself before Peter in an act of deep reverence. Peter demonstrated his humility as well. It was a custom to bow down before men of high honor, showing reverence and respect for them. But God had humbled Peter too. And I'll never forget, when, when Cornelius humbled himself and got down before Peter, Peter quickly said, no, 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 stand up. I'm a man just like you are. I'm a man as well. You're talking two men that are humbled by the power of God. It doesn't make them weak. Cornelius was an was a Italian commander in the, in the military. He wasn't a weak man. Peter wasn't weak. He was willing to stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wasn't a weak man. He went into Gentile territory knowing that the Jews could come after him and kill him. That's why he took his witnesses. Peter wasn't weak. Cornelius wasn't weak. But they were humble men before God. And church, I've got to tell you, God is looking for some humble people that he can use in the kingdom, in his kingdom. Peter now knew that no man was common or unclean. Christ had abolished the distinction between Jew and Gentile. Christ had abolished the wall of partisan between Jew and Gentile. Christ had abolished all distinction between men, whether racial, social, or some caste system. The lesson that Cornelius learned was that a man who truly seeks God moves God. Cornelius declared that God was the answer of his prayers. Cornelius discovered that a man who seeks God must listen to God and obey God, and a man who seeks God must be receptive to the word of God. I'm going to read this again. A man who truly seeks God moves God. Let's be a man and woman who truly seeks God. I love this, this story in the Bible because of the fact that God is working two things at once. We're doing the prayer of one, and the reason is, is because we're going to pray that God will begin to move on the hearts of the people, that you're going to put the names down, and that God's going to pre begin to prepare their heart to receive the word that you have for them. And then we're going to pray that God will give you, because he's already given you the boldness through Holy Spirit, he's going to give you the empowerment to be a witness to these people. And that when the two come together, it'll be a Cornelius and Peter experience. Because when you see what happens, Peter was busy preaching to Cornelius' house. He's preaching about the death and resurrection of Christ. And the Bible says in verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. You hear how God operates. You hear how God operates in our life. Every week, I want you to start personally praying for the salvation of one unsaved person, church. Every week, I want you to lift their name specifically. And I want you to ask God to give you wisdom and guidance. This has got to be somebody that you can go to that you see on a regular basis. Not a phone call. Not an auntie or an uncle in Georgia or Texas or anywhere else. But somebody local. Somebody that you see. Somebody that you meet with. Because in a little while, we're going to pray that God will use you to deliver his gospel to them. And like Cornelius, the whole house will be touched. Amen? Are you with me, church? I'm closing. Would you stand with me, please? The 
Bible says that we must realize we are all sinners in need of forgiveness in Romans 3.23. It says, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 5.8, it says, but God demonstrates his love towards us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then in Romans 10, it says that if you confess with your mouth that Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. This morning, if you're here and you haven't accepted Christ, or maybe it's been a long time and you've gotten away, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to lead you in a prayer right now. Just repeat this with me. Let's just everybody repeat this with me. I confess you, Lord Jesus. And I believe in my heart that God has raised you from the dead. Forgive me of my sins. Speak to my heart. Change my life. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. If you said that prayer and you meant that prayer in your heart, you've just given your heart to Jesus Christ. Something simple, something easy. Now believe in faith. By grace, you're saved. Walk in the victory. And church, I want to encourage you, just like with Peter and Cornelius. Here Peter is 30 miles away and God's speaking to him. Just like at the same time, Cornelius is being spoken to. And God brings the two together, and they change the world. Listen, I want you to be seated for a minute, just one minute. I want you to get a tithing envelope placed in front of you there. And I want you, everyone to write down the name of one person. Okay? Write down the name of one person. And then as soon as you're done, lift your card up. And the ushers are going to come by and collect them. This is somebody that's going to go in our prayer bowl right here. We're going to pray over these names. Nobody's going to see these. We're just going to keep them in a prayer bowl. Our intercessory prayer team will be praying over them as well. <clears throat> After service, I want everybody to invade Adam so he can show you that picture he's painted. Is that okay, Adam? Adam's like, sure. <laughs> Amen. Has everybody had a chance to turn your card in? Ushers, if you could bring those up here, that'd be great. Oh, there's some in the back. Three full this time. That's great. Thank you, Chris. Amen. If you would, just reach your hands this way. Father God, we just pray for every name represented in this prayer bowl here, Father. Lord, we ask that... represent people who don't know you yet, the people that you died for, that they don't even know who you are. Lord, I pray, like I said, that they would have a Cornelius experience where you would begin to speak to their heart, Lord, 
and prepare them. Even let them know that, that, that Adam is going to come and speak to them about you. Or that Morgan is going to come and speak to them about you, Lord. Just prepare their heart, Father. Go before your, your children here, Lord. So that the doors in the heavens are open ever, over every one of these people, Lord. And Father, we just pray for the testimonies of salvations to come forth from this, Lord. We pray for the healings and the miracles to take place in this prayer bowl right here, Lord. And Father, in this, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor, Lord. And Father, now I pray that you would bless Bethel. Lord, I thank you for the job provision that you've brought in for Julie, Lord. And Father, I pray for others that are in her boat that, that need a job or a better job or bonuses and raises, Lord, that you would bring those bonuses and raises in, Lord. Father, I pray for families and I pray for the children of families, Lord, husbands and wives, that you would touch them and you would draw the relationship closer and tighter before you, Lord. And Father, I pray for the prodigal children, Lord, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, all the prodigals, Lord. I pray for them, Lord, and I pray that their names are in these bowls, Father, so that as we bathe them in prayer, they'll be like the prodigal coming back home, Lord, seeking you out, seeking their families, Lord, with full repentance in their heart, Lord Jesus. And we just declare victory in the name of Jesus. Satan, you have to take your hands off of these people right now. You have to take your hands, and we come against any strongholds. We come against any addictions, Lord Jesus, that these people may have. Father, Father, that you'll just begin to break those off of them as well. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless Bethel, Lord. Bless us as we come. Bless us as we go, Lord Jesus. And Father, in this, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor in your holy, precious name. And everybody said amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday night, 630 for adults and 6 for youth. Have a great week.